Maybe. Maybe. Okay, we're live. I mean, we are okay. so sorry for the delay. We are so sorry for the delay. I can go to the but we're back. <laughs> and we're going to hope that we can get through this. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Super excited to be here with some of my favorite people. We have Valencia Gunder, who's having some technical difficulties, who will be joining us a little bit later. But I want to introduce the first two panelists. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about um, tonight we're going to be talking about and the racial, racial implications of mass incarceration, and we're going to talk about the documentary Thirteenth, the amazing documentary by Alba Duvernay. And um, sorry, first let me say my name is Renee. Um, I'm here with New Florida Majority. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the organization, but we're an independent organization working to increase political power in Black and Brown communities across the state. So excited to be here. So um, excited to be here. Tonight. I hope um, that everyone can hear me tonight. I can't hope hear that me. Can hear Please me. drop a comment, hear me. And, let me drop a comment not, and let me know whether you're able to hear your experience. Let us know. So I want to introduce so I um, tonight's, um, tonight's panelist. Tonight's panelist. Have Melba Pearson have here, Melba who's the deputy director of Florida. 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 So excited. So excited here. Before joining the show, you know, you he was Mr. State Attorney in Miami County for six years. He has lots and lots of routine. I'm so I'm sorry, sorry that, that you're getting an echo. Can you guys hear me? Is there an echo still? Okay. So um, next up, we have Rod Kemp who um, is a part of the Second Chances campaign. Um, he's great, he's formerly incarcerated, he's had some issues with his voting rights, and he's here to talk about the Second Chances campaign, which is the, second the initiative campaign, to restore which is voting rights, the initiative to restore voting rights, and he's, he has his own personal um, story that he's he has his own personal tonight. story tonight. He's gonna share with I us wanna, tonight. Um, I wanna, um, oh, the echo's back. Oh, the echo's back. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, guys. Um, I would, um, I would, I'm hoping I'm that hoping that go go. I don't know what else I don't know what else to do. <laughs> um, um, I want to start, start out by letting Melba talk about, about her journey, journey through the ACLU and her experience as a state attorney and what that looks like for um, really mass incarceration and her experience with um, people who use their voting rights, people who ACLU use their voting rights, because ACLU is a part of the thing. You have a guest in the back, and um. <laughs> and just your journey to your current role. And then I want to let Rod talk about his experience with restoring his voting rights and what that looked for him. Um, so Melba, if you don't mind kicking us off, that'd be great. Oh, okay, so I lost a little bit of the audio, so I'm going to um, kind of wing it a little bit. <laughs> So hello everyone. Um, I was a prosecutor for 16 years here in Miami and I had a very interesting journey with regards to the criminal justice system. Being a prosecutor was an amazing job for me because I got to work with victims of color and I had the misfortune as well as the opportunity to hold mothers that were weeping over the deaths of the senseless deaths of their um, sons to gun violence and being able to try to bring them some sort of justice. The balance and the, the other half of that was working with defendants and making sure that they got justice as well. And the one recurring theme that I kept seeing in the criminal justice system was the fact that there wasn't enough programming. Um, if you had folks with addictions, especially um, African-Americans with addictions, they were not getting the treatment that they needed to be able to get their lives together again and get on that path to recovery. Um, we also had the situation of disparate sentencing. And while I did my part as a prosecutor to make sure that the sentences I gave out were, were just and to make sure that the rules were enforced fairly, I, can, I couldn't say that systemically. I couldn't say that systemically. Our, our criminal justice system worked. Um, so that combined with the events of November of last year uh, definitely made me 
take a different path and decide to be more active with regards to not only criminal justice reform, but voting rights and civil rights for people as a whole, but especially people that look like me. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Let me know. Let you me guys know if you guys me. can hear me because I'm definitely hearing an echo on my end. Um, I want thank you. V was having some technical difficulties, but she's here. Um, Valencia Gunder is a Soros Justice Fellow, as well as the coalition organizer at New Florida Majority. She's a community activist. She's the founder of Make the Homeless Smile. Um, she's awesome. And we want to welcome you to the conversation, V. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Melba just got done telling us about her experience and her journey to the ACLU Florida, um, and ACLU Florida, and her journey to, um, and her journey to from um, from being a prosecutor from to now joining the ACLU. Um, we want to give ACLU. Rod an opportunity to talk about um, his role, and and I just wanted to reiterate. So we're talking about the documentary Thirteen, and how it intersects the role of race, justice, all of those things intersect in mass incarceration, and what that looks like for Black and Brown people. Um, and the 13th Amendment, which freed the slaves, that then um, continued slavery through certain issues like convict leasing, lyn lynchings, Jim Crow, disenfranchisement. And since we're talking about disenfranchisement, we're going to reiterate Amendment 4, which is the Voting Restoration Amendment, which looks to restore voting rights to over 1.5 million people in Florida, Florida citizens that have lost their, permanently lost their right to vote. And Rod has um, personal experience with this and I wanna give him an opportunity to talk about his his journey and how he came to be a part of the Second Chances um, initiative. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Roderick Kemp. I live here in South Florida. Um, the way I became part of this is mine was an unusual circumstance and it was totally unexpected. Uh, not your typical uh, story or situation where uh, someone has committed a crime, you know, a felony, uh, and then immediately serves time or probation and then has to wait the five to seven year period, uh, and then apply for clemency. Uh, for me, uh, I moved to Florida, um, over 20 years ago and, um, and, um, I got in trouble, but at the time it didn't seem, they said it was, um, a felony, a minor felony. And to me, it didn't seem like it was that serious. And uh, it wasn't treated in that way. I didn't like serve any uh, typical uh, prison time or anything like that. It was just, um, I think 60 days in county jail. And I went right back to my job and I went on with my life. Fast forward about 20 years, more than 20 years after raising a family, uh, having several professional careers, going through Leadership Broward, being appointed on di different advisory boards, actually running a couple of local uh, political campaigns, uh, forming my own political action committee. Uh, so I was very involved in the process. And all this time I have been voting uh, and also ran a field office during the last uh, Florida governor's race. And then completely out of the blue, after the election was over, I got a notice in the mail that I've been removed from the statewide registry. And, you know, when we speak of Amendment 13, it has evolved and it may have changed in certain ways over the years and over time since the reconstruction period of the Civil War. But because of its existence and, and, and how it is utilized, that gave them the opportunity to go ahead and purge someone like me from the voting records. Um, that just goes to show that, you know, it gives them the ability, not only just because they have a case in point that you've committed a crime, but they actually look for a way to go back and find more people to purge from the voting records. So um, naturally uh, being politically involved, I went to, two state representatives that I personally know, told them my story. Uh, and they said that they, they would see what they can do on my behalf. I even went to my local uh, supervisor of elections and uh, I was like, what the heck is going on? 
You know, this is not how it typically happens. This, this is something's wrong here. Something's funny. Um, and then eventually I got introduced to uh, Desmond Mead, who has been spearheading this movement for quite some time. And uh, he looked me up, checked my records and stuff and said that that was the first time you ever heard of somebody who, because of something that happened over 20 years ago, then they get their voting rights uh, taken away. Usually it happens when you commit the crime. So uh, eventually um, a film crew used me as a, a subject and they told my story and it was released uh, nationwide online uh, with the Atlantic, MoveOn.org, Time Magazine, and many other uh, outlets. Apparently, if you know how the process works, Apparently, it must have got back to the governor's office. They didn't like the publicity. And um, the in October 2016, when they took my rights away, the following year in February 2017, I got a letter that they gave my rights back. They, they restored my rights. Now, that even goes further to show how arbitrary the process is. Uh, and, you know, Florida being one of the only few remaining states that is basically still living uh, in a Jim Crow environment when it comes to voting rights. Um, and it's something that when you look at the makeup of the clemency board and you got the secretary of agriculture and a few other people that have absolutely nothing to do with civilian law other than the governor himself, where who basically is where the buck stops and the attorney general, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And why would all of that power be concentrated and available to just one person instead of it being a fair and impartial process? And I think that Amendment 4 is going to change that. And that's the intent of Amendment 4 is that it becomes an amendment to the Constitution that no longer, depending on who's in office, um, that a person's fate will be decided. It will be decided by the voters who say that everybody deserves a second chance. Once you pay your debt to society, you deserve a second chance. And, you know, everybody to some degree has had second, third, fourth, fifth chances. We've all run a stop sign. We've all run a red light. So when you think of it in that way, we all have broken the law, uh, but there's a, a degree of uh, a violation, which is considered a felony. But then again, when you look at what a felony charge is, the majority of people that are in jail serving time or have a felony charge, they're very minor offenses. They're not murderers, you know, there's not armed robbery is, you know, the things that we perceive it to be. You know, there are many, many, many examples of how you can easily get a felony um, too many citations, DUI, writing a bad check, releasing a Mylar balloon, uh, breaks the Florida Clean Air Act, you know, so there's many, many reasons. And again, you know, when I saw uh, the 13th Amendment, it really opened my eyes to what I already knew, but even uh, made it more three-dimensional and uh, more of a reality how systematically since reconstruction period this has been an ongoing way of disenfranchising people thank you for letting me speak <clears throat> thank you for sharing your story rod we appreciate it um I am so glad that we have V here to talk about women and how we are often excluded from the conversation um, around mass incarceration. But when we talk about mass incarceration, we want to let folks know that we're talking about the increase in incarcerated people in U.S. prisons over the last 40 years. So I have some statistics that I want to share with you all um, really about the increase in, in, in incarceration. Um, and in 1980, there were about 40,000 people that were incarcerated for drugs in the United States. In 2015, that number was nearly 500,000. 
that's over a thousand percent increase over the course of 35 years. So we're seeing an increase in um, incarceration due to the war on drugs, due to the tough on crime policies, due to all of these things that really impact black and brown communities. But what we do know is that um, black men have really a, a stronghold. They're, they're the forefront of the conversation when we're talking about incarceration. Um, but black women are often excluded from that discussion. So we have Valencia Gunder here, who's gonna tell us a little bit about the black woman's experience with incarceration and how mass incarceration impacts, impacts black women um, and what that looks like and how we're neglected, how we're excluded from that conversation. V? Hi, everybody. Again, this is Valencia Gunder. Everybody calls me V. And um, Renee already told you my little bio or whatever, but um, I just wanted to share like how I lost my right. Um, I um, wrote a check for my last semester in school. The check bounced. And um, three years after leaving school, I was pulled over in Miami. I went to school in Tallahassee, pulled over in Miami, and they said I had a fugitive warrant out for my arrest for one check, and um, they extradited me across the state. Now, the extra um, to get extradited, um, in my ignorance at the time, I thought they were going to just put me in the back of a van and send me across the state, and I'll get there in like a day or two, you know. Um, but no, it didn't go like that. Um, I was sent down to TGK down in Miami, was there for just a few hours, and they sent me over to the county um, jail down by the courthouse in downtown Miami. I was there for a night. I was there for about four or five days. <clears throat> then they um, took me back to the county for two days. And I don't know if anybody ever been inside of the county jail before, but it's a disgusting place that nobody, adult or live in, on a human being. Then I um, was called in the middle of the night and I was sent to Broward County. Um, excuse me, everybody, this next piece may be a little X rated. Um, I was on my cycle the entire time. Um, as a woman, when you get stressed, and you have your cycle sometimes either it come on or it comes on very heavy and it stays on. So I was at the ladder and I got to Broward Sheriff's office and they put me in a holding cell by myself, um, which it was extremely hot and they would not give me a sanitary napkin. I was there three days. It would not, it would not give me a sanitary napkin. And I sat there in my fluids until I was taken over to Paul Ryan, which is another facility in Broward County where they cleaned me up, gave me what I needed, and they, you know, had me see the doctor and the nurse to get me back up to par. And that was for three days, and they sent me back to BSO. Um, and I sat there again for another three days without a sanitary napkin. And when they took me out of BSO to travel up to Leon County, they put me in the back of a van at three o'clock in the morning, pitch black, and it was six men and I'm one woman. And immediately as I was getting in the van, I heard the guy saying, oh, we got something for her. So I got scared instantly and I just prepared myself. I was shackled, my hands in my feet. Mind you, I hadn't had a sanitary napkin in three days and they put me inside of a van with six men. And I just prepared myself to get raped and beat up in the back of this van and just scared. Didn't know what I was going to do. I had long braids in, which, you know, that stuff that can grab and hold you down. And um, I guess it was God, we can say, um, when some light hit my face and two of the guys in the back of the van knew me from my old neighborhood. So they, you know, calmed the guys down, was like, that's my little sister. We can't do that to her. And then they was explaining to me how women are raped in the back of these vans all the time. They are raped in the back of the vans. Um, these men also explained how sometimes the jails do not give women the proper things they need to survive. And I had, was already experiencing it. So I got to Leon County hours later, weak, oh. barely could stand. Um, and when I got there, the 
um, correctional officers were just surprised to see what I looked like because they were like, I was weak. Like they had to drag me in the door because I was losing so much fluid because of my cycle. And um, only thing they gave me to eat was ham sandwiches and I don't eat ham. So I wasn't eating and they gave me water to drink. So um, in all fairness, Leon County did make sure I got what I needed to get myself back up to par. But that was just a horrid experience, like to sit in a place and they wouldn't give you what you need. And, you know, when these guards get upset with these anybody, with women or the men, they don't like to give them soap, shampoo, tissue, all these different things that you need to, you know, for your basic needs. And for me to just experience that, just being extradited across the state, I started to think like women go through this all the time. And I, um, so just fast forward a little bit, I was in jail a total of 31 days. So I bounced around to what? One, two, three, four, five, six, six jails in three different counties. Um, to get extradited across the state. Um, when I got there, um, found out that they tried to give me a plea deal of three years for one check. I turned the plea down and my lawyer went back and thank goodness I didn't take the plea because this big case hit the fan and um, this judge in this um, attorney, district attorney, I assume, um, they were actually... Um, targeting black students in Leon County. And it's overheating. I'm so sorry. Hello? Sorry. So, um, yeah, so I ended up getting a new judge because this judge got disbarred and um, found out that he was over sentencing um, black students from FAMU while in Leon County. And as I do my um, organizing across the state, I find out that so many, um, so many um, individuals actually saw the same judge. They called him Hangum Hankerson in Leon County. Um, but I ended up getting, um, 30 days in. So that was time served two years on probation and I was a felon. So I lost all my rights. I couldn't vote. So, um, for a long time, for about four or five years, I walked, I walked around like it was like a scar. So I would cover it. Like I wouldn't tell anybody I went to jail. I even used the alias on Facebook for a long time. Um, as I was trying to, um, you know, just rebuild myself as I was um, going through all of these different things. And um, it wasn't until I met Desmond in 2000. B is having some technical difficulties. Um, we're gonna allow her uh, a couple minutes to come back. But I saw Melba shaking her head. And if Melba can hear me, um, I wanted to give her a moment to talk about how these, um, you know, tough on crime legislation impacts black and brown communities and even situations like situations that B got caught up in um, as far as them trying to force people to cop plea deals and what that, what that really um, looks like in black and brown communities. And also if you can talk about the power held by local prosecutors, um, that would be great because this is a way for our communities to fight back and push back against some of these things. So I'm just really heartbroken to hear um, V's story. I've, I've met her a number of times and um, have worked with her, but it's very ironic how you can sit next to someone and not know what they've been through and the path that brought them to, to where they are today. And I think that's what's really critical about movies like 13th, because, you know, if, if many people 
go through life never either number one, encountering somebody who's been in the system, or number two, as you know, V and Rod referenced earlier, you know, you may have that in your past, but that's not the first thing you're telling somebody when you meet them. So people don't have the benefit of hearing stories like this and knowing the reality of the horrors that occur in the criminal justice system. So movies like 13th are so critical because it brings to the masses and lays bare the ugliness that is the criminal justice system. And with that knowledge, then people can go to the polls. They can hold hold their district attorneys accountable. They can hold their public defenders accountable as well, whether it be that public defenders are walking their clients into pleas without adequately fighting for them, or on the flip side, that public defenders don't have the resources to be able to adequately fight for their clients. So there's that aspect. And then additionally, knowing exactly what's happening in the system that companies are using the loophole of the 13th Amendment uh, to be able to get people to work for basically free. I mean, they're having inmates working for free as opposed to letting them work at a normal rate so they can have money in their commissary so they can have money to start their lives over again. Because 83%, 83% of people who go to prison come back out. So what are we doing to set them up for success? So th that's why it's really important to keep these dialogues going, to have as much as it's painful and, and gut-wrenching to hear these stories and to see it on film, we have to have those stories be told so that we can make our society better, that we can fight for folks who don't have a voice and be able to make sure that we can hold our politicians accountable and get change in this system. But additionally, just a, do you want me to, okay, we're good. <laughs> okay, um, but just to talk about um, how tough on crime legislation is really, and, I, and my apologies, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but um, it's, it's really critical that we take a look at how this, these legislations and these laws are negatively impacting our communities because part of the issue is that number one, and, and I hate to say this, but I got to put it out there. Back in the eighties, when we had the crack epidemic, you know, you had certain community leaders who were saying, Oh, we got to have tougher sentences for the dope man, tougher sentences for the dope man. And unfortunately, you know, there are folks in power who are like, really, that's what you really want. And they gave it to us. And then that, was part of how we ended up with some of these minimum mandatories. Now, as time went on, as we looked back at the Obama administration and, you know, the, the work he did for eight years under that, with that Justice Department to try to dismantle it, we now have an administration that's trying to go back to these policies that, as we saw, don't work, they don't keep communities safer, and they wipe out an entire generation of black men, you know, men of color and leaving women in very vulnerable situations, as well as ca catching up women as well. So we have to be very careful when we are advocating for different legislation or, or programs and things like that to really look down the pike and make sure that we're not handing over tools to be able to be used against us in some shape or form. And also at the same token, stay vigilant and stay woke to make sure that folks aren't trying to pull one over on us saying, oh, but we're trying to help you when in reality they're not and they have their own best interest at heart. Thank you, Melba, for sharing. Thank you. B, I know you got caught, cut off. Um, was there anything that you wanted to add to what you were saying before your connection went bad? Oh, sorry, guys. My phone got overheated. I'm a, I apologize for that. But I was just saying that, like, um, when I got out, like, I hid the fact that I was a felon. Like, I didn't tell anybody. I was embarrassed. Um in my ignorance, because I didn't know anything, I just thought like I couldn't get a better job or I would never be able to accomplish my goals because of this one thing. And I met Desmond back in 2016. And he was like the first person I ever met that was just like, 
oh, you're a returning citizen? Me too. And I was just like, you're proud of that? And he was like, well, I made my mistake and we're going to fix it. And that's when he told me about let my people vote and about how he was working on this thing to get us our voting rights back. And I started working at the New Florida Majority and I went from hiding it to sharing my story um, to my to people locally to working nationally now with other sisters who are formerly incarcerated, um, working in partnership with Cut 50, um, with the Hope House Ministries in New York, um, and other great sisters like the um, National Council for Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And um, it's just like many other people, Susan Rosenberg. I mean, I can name so many amazing sisters from around the country who are just doing some great work to make sure that we have our proper rights um, and get respected as women in and out of the prisons. Um, that just made me change my mind. So now when I'm asked to share my story, I do it proudly. Um, want to be an example of how your life can change, even though you may have made that mistake. And then two, how with you being upfront with what's going on, a lot of people can help you. And um, in that case, you can help a lot of other people. Thank you, Lee. <clears throat> My next question is really about the, the documentary. Um, I want to know how important is this documentary, both within and outside of the criminal justice system? And I'm hoping that everyone um, who's joining us tonight has seen the documentary 13. Um, but if you haven't, let us know. Actually, drop it in here because we're going to have another uh, viewing where we're going to screen the movie online and folks can join and watch the movie with us. Um, but how important is this documentary in educating folks? And what are some of the key takeaways that you got um, from the documentary? And Rod, if you would like to go first, um, and then V, you know, you guys can jump in, but what do you think about the documentary? What are some of the key takeaways that you got? How naive I previously was years ago, uh, when still living in California, I ran a recycling plant and uh, we had accounts with uh, a lot of the big banks and movie studios and engineering firms that would store important documents with us. And then they would call us up periodically when they needed a certain lot of documents to store. We would shred that paper into different grades of paper and put them in bells and ship them overseas to markets like Japan and so forth. We don't have a forestry industry as large as we do. The reason why I'm telling this really quick is because I was naive about the fact that all of my employees were through a work release program. And when you look at it from a business perspective, it was cheap labor. It was a form of, you know, slavery uh, to an extent. Um, in the guise of them learning some, getting some work release credits and so forth and good behavior. So um, when seeing the 13th amendment, uh, that was the first thing that jumped out at me uh, of how it has been used to provide a continued source of free or very cheap labor in, in many different industries uh, and in many different ways. Uh, and it is actually legal to provide slave labor through the penal system that still exists today. That just blew me away. I mean, that's that's just, you know, because I'm a guy that's fortunate enough that I can go to uh, where my family originated from in Georgia, and I can go to my great, great grandmother's headstone uh, where I have done the math and realized that she was only 25 years old when the Civil War broke out. So she was a slave and saw emancipation. Uh, yet, despite that, uh, through the penal system, slavery still exists. Uh, so that was one of the th main things that uh, jumped out at me. And then also too, um, as I stated before, with my personal experience, it has permeated throughout the judicial system and how people are processed, how they're persecuted, 
and it feeds into the prison industrial complex um, the way that uh, the outcomes happen in our court system. Oh, thanks for sharing, Rod. Thank you. Um, v or Melba, do you guys want to chime in? I can go. I can go. Um, um, for myself, for myself, I um, I think immediately when I saw it, I got like extremely heavy because. Both of my parents are formerly incarcerated due to the crack cocaine era. And myself and my brother, my brother just got out of federal prison just two months ago. He's on the ankle monitor. And just to see like how generationally, like systemically, it has been put into our community for it to continue to happen over and over again. And like my parents, both of my parents were on, on drugs and that's why they went to prison when they should have have gotten treatment um, because my mom has only been clean five years. So putting her in prison didn't stop her from doing anything, just to be clear. Um, she got clean when she got the proper help. And then to see like, because of the prison system and all that stuff, I missed out on my parents, right? My parents didn't raise me. And then we end up growing, in, growing up in a community or in a situation that forces you to sometimes make decisions or put yourself in situations that causes you to also um, be criminalized also. So oftentimes, like, I, I in the documentary, it talked a lot about, like, the whole war on drugs, right? And I was always so interested because even though I'm a millennial, I am a crack baby. You get what I'm saying? So I saw how this system not only criminalized my parents, but it criminalized us too. And it wasn't until I seen the documentary that I totally understood what was happening to me as a child. Even into like when it came to the programming that they had in the schools and all of that stuff, like that was systemically oppression in my opinion. If you look at it, like I can remember times where we were in school and they would bring the dogs in, in our classrooms to sniff our book bags to see if we have drugs. And we were in third, fourth grade. And when I saw the movie, well, I saw the documentary and they were talking about like how this war on drugs and what was the legislation behind it and all of these things that was happening. And then how it was people in our own community supporting it, not knowing that it, how it was hurting us on so it kind of sort of like took me back because one, it finally like made me make sense of what happened to me in my life. And um I'm also, it also pushed me to go research more and to understand more. Um, as I have, um, and I, as I looked more deeply into it, like how the laws are just put in place for you to just make any small mistake. And then the fact that you are black and the fact that you grew up in this zip code and the fact that you went to this specific schools that are they just lining you up for the foolishness. And I was like disappointed in myself uh, when I got locked up because I'm like, I'm making the same mistakes my parents made. But then now that I know better, it's like it's the same system screwing over the same people generation after generation. And um, I'm just so happy that the documentary was made to like teach everybody about what's going on around mass incarceration and how it is slavery, you know, um, and then how like they mentally do try to destroy you from being in that process. Right. So um, I just really love that they went so in detail around that around like the, the different cases that may have come out of that that were very unfair and unfortunate that people had to deal with. Um, and they talked about um, just how the drugs were getting into our community, how the government was um, using it to get votes opposed to like taking care of the people. They were just saying anything and signing any bills and doing all of this stuff to hurt us on the long run opposed to uplifting the community because at the end of the day, Drugs, just like gun violence, is a public health issue. 
and unless you use prevention and and um and pub public safety and health to fix it is not going to fix itself. So that's why you have more people getting on crack, cocaine, and drugs all the time, and people were not getting healthy because they were just throwing them in jail opposed to helping them. And I feel as if that's the same thing that happens now with a lot of different crimes. Like people make mistakes, and instead of getting them the help that they need for them not to make this mistake again, they just throw you in jail, give you a, a DC number, and throw you to the wolves. Melba, did you want to chime in? Well, so I, I just have to say that, you know, I'm just listening to all of these stories and, you know, I've, I've got a whole lot of emotions going on right now. But um, I remember the first time I saw the movie 13th and the first thing that popped into my head was the opiate crisis and now how you know i grew up in new york and everybody knew growing up in new york that you went to harlem to get your heroin that's what you did our people have been addicted to heroin coming back from the vietnam war um you know just it's just living in 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 certain communities had that addiction but they were incarcerated but now that the complexion of the problem has changed all of a sudden it's a public health issue all of a sudden is, oh, we got to get rehab. We've got to figure out, you know, we got to help these people. You got to crack down on these doctors. But that was not the discussion when it came to our brothers and sisters who are addicted to crack cocaine or addicted to heroin, whatever the case may be. The mindset was incarcerate your way out of the problem. So part of that is racism. But part of it, the bottom line is always money. Because if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. And the 13th really talked about ALEC, which is a conservative organization that literally were writing bills that were destroying black and brown communities. You want to know where Stand Your Ground came from? It came from ALEC. They literally drafted those bills, handed them to certain lawmakers. Those lawmakers introduced them on the floor and they ended up getting passed. And now those stand your ground laws are being used to murder black and brown people across the country. So you have to watch what our lawmakers are doing. We've got to hold them accountable. That's one thing that 13th definitely teaches you. Um, the private prison industry, how they profit off of the pain of black and brown people. And they're making money hand over fist. And a lot of these companies, you know, you, you, you follow the money, they're donating to certain representatives and to certain senators. So we got to do our research before we get in the ballot box and see who's getting money from who. So that's another thing that 13th definitely left me with. Um, but what, what also perturbed me as a former prosecutor was the fact that now these same people who are all about private prisons and all that were like, no, you know what? We need criminal justice reform. I don't, I don't trust it. I don't trust it because that means there's a money angle to it somewhere. Somebody is going to profit off of whatever comes next. So we have to be very vigilant to protect our own on this because somebody's making money. We've got to figure out when it comes to reentry, when we have our people coming back into our communities, what are we doing to help them? Like if you've got a business, you've got to hire some a returning citizen. That's the only way you can help people get back on their feet because I can assure you this administration is not going to do that for us. So we've got to do it for ourselves. We've got to do it from a grassroots level. And at the same token, we've got to vote for people who support civil rights and civil liberties and hold them accountable. Because just because they're a member of a particular party doesn't mean they're always going to do right by us. So we have to always make sure to vote our interests and to vote our issues. And if we are finding that a particular district attorney is not supportive of criminal justice reform and is a part of the prison industrial complex, they got to go. If you have a mayor that's not trying to get funding and fund reentry programs and fund diversion programs and fund ways to help people, you know, keep, keep their lives intact, they got to go. 
So that to me was some of the biggest takeaways from, from 13th and, and how we can move forward. I'm so glad that we have you on Melba. Um, I think this is a great balance of folks joining the discussion today. Um, I, I'm so glad about ways that we can combat this issue in our community. And I wanna know if we can expound upon um, the role of local prosecutors and district attorneys um, and how we can vote in our best interest um, in our communities. I'm hoping she can hear me. One second. Um. So what um, I think the question is what the role is of the local prosecutors and district attorneys, state attorneys, however you want to refer to it, with regards to criminal justice reform and, and all of these issues that we've been discussing today. One of the critical things to look at, for instance, if um, y'all have been watching in Philadelphia, the new district attorney in Philadelphia, Larry Krasner, ran on a platform that was straight up criminal justice reform. He makes his assistant district attorneys get up in court, and if they're incarcerating somebody, they have to say on the record that it is, and, and I'm not positive of the number, but I'll just make up a number for now. It is $30,000 per year to incarcerate this person. This person's being incarcerated for three years at a cost of $90,000 to the taxpayer. I think this is important for community safety because of these reasons. And they have to outline all of those reasons on the record. This way it's public and everybody knows why someone's being sentenced in a certain way and at what cost. So he is definitely being a maverick in the way he is approaching criminal justice reform. You have other district attorneys like Kim Fox in Chicago, who uh, unseated Alvarez, who was not prosecuting police officers for the deaths of unarmed people of color. You have Aramis Ayala in Orlando, who is having a hell of a time right now because of her stance on the death penalty. So we have to make sure that when we have prosecutors that are elected that support criminal justice reform, that they are supported, that we rally around them, that we reelect them, because I can assure you those forces who are not making money or these forces who are racist, whatever the case may be, are going to be putting their best foot forward to make sure that these folks are only serving one term. So it's very critical that we as the people exercise our rights and vote in every election. I'm going to keep saying it over and over again, we got to vote, okay? Because if we sit it out, we see what happens, okay? We see what happens. And prosecutors are the ones who decide what charges are filed. Prosecutors decide whether or not charges get dropped. They decide whether you get drug treatment or you end up going to prison. They decide if for a bounce check, they're going to put you in a diversion program and put you on, you know, let you pay it off for over the course of six months or a year, or they're going to send you to prison. That's the prosecutor's role. And we can't sleep on that. OK, when I was a prosecutor, I took that very seriously. But I will admit there were things that I was ignorant about. I didn't know that women got raped in the back of, of vans or that they were even transported with men. It didn't even occur to me that that could happen. Nobody tells you that. You know what I'm saying? So while you have folks who mean well, there are certain things that we just don't know. And I, when I say we, I don't mean just prosecutors. I just mean us as people, which goes back to the relevance and the importance of movies like 13th and hearing stories like those from Rod and those from V, you know, hearing from impacted persons, because once we know we can do better and we can hold our district attorneys accountable, we can hold the Department of Corrections accountable because there's a secretary of the Department of Corrections who works for the governor. And if these things are happening, that's happening on her watch. And we got to make sure she's being held accountable. And if she's not, then who's her boss? Oh, the governor. OK, well, we're in a governor's race right now. So we should be asking our gubernatorial candidates where they stand on these issues. So while the district attorney plays a role, we play a role, a huge role in making sure that we're holding folks accountable because they work for us. And if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, they got to go. Just like if you're not doing what you're supposed to do on your job, you end up going. Same thing. We fire them. We can fire them every four years. So that's my thoughts on that.
Oh, um, and so there was a question about Marilyn Mosby. She's hanging in there. They dismissed, there was a lawsuit filed by the police officers who um, she charged in the death of Freddie Gray. Um, unfortunately, most of the officers were acquitted in those cases. It was a bench trial, which means there was no jury involved. And then with the last two officers, the, the cases were dropped because it was clear that there was not going to be any convictions. So the police officers then sued Marilyn Mosby be in Baltimore saying that she it was a malicious prosecution and she was abusing her power. That lawsuit got kicked out of court. You know why? Because as a prosecutor, you have the power and the discretion to decide what's going to happen with each individual case. And unless there's some crazy finding that you know, you're basically making up evidence, you're going to be able to move forward. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing, Melba. We really appreciate you. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing that you mentioned that was super important was about cross-cultural collaboration, which is a term that I that I feel like V coined, and I got that from her. But um, I think it's super important to really reach across different sectors and really talk about the issues that impact um, marginalized communities. I know that V just had um, an event called Beyond the March, and it was about violence um, in inner city communities with um, youth. And she had, um, what was interesting about that was she had elected officials, she had police officers, she had students, she had parents, she had all these people in the room to talk about their, um, to talk about the youth's experience. So the youth were sharing their views on what violence looks like in their communities and how it impacts them. And everybody was there to listen. And I thought it was super powerful to have all of those folks in the room because just like Melba mentioned, um, sometimes people just don't know. But instead of not knowing, um, it's important for us to one, hold them accountable and two, for people to reach back and really um, think about how these policies, how, how these legislation, how all of these things impact marginalized communities and communities that are often excluded from the conversation. Um, so I just wanted to do a shameless plug on the Black Women's Assembly that's happening this summer, June 22nd and 23rd, um, because it's super important. And we're gonna talk about a lot of different issues, but one of them is how mass incarceration impacts Black women and girls from the school to prison pipeline um, <coughs> and Black women in general. Um, and we're also gonna talk about affordable housing. We're gonna talk about immigration. I know someone mentioned earlier how criminal is it, how immigrants are criminalized. Someone mentioned it earlier, but that's one of the topics that we're gonna discuss at the Black Women's Assembly. It's completely free. It's here in Miami this summer, June 22nd and 23rd. And if you want more information, we just dropped the link to the event right here. And if you wanna donate, um, you can go visit the website at herecomestheboom.org. It's gonna be a super powerful weekend and I hope that everyone can join. And Melba also mentioned um, holding our elected officials accountable and holding people who are running for office accountable. There's a gubernatorial debate happening. It's an election year. Um, there's a gubernatorial debate happening this summer, June 11th at Miramar um, Cultural Center. And it's a place where we'll be able to hear from <coughs> these folks who are the Democratic candidates running for governor. We'll hear from them on issues that impact us in our community, one of them being um, criminal justice reform. I'm, I'm sure they're gonna talk about Amendment 4 and um, their plans to restore the ability to vote to those 1.5 million people who've permanently lost their right to vote. Um, I wanna open it up for questions from anyone. We dropped a link for the Black Women's Assembly that's there, the gubernatorial debate. I wanna know if anyone has any questions and I'm super glad that we had Melba join us tonight V, thank you. Rod, thank you for sharing your stories. Melba, thank you for your expertise, your legal expertise. Um, <clears throat> does anyone have any questions here that we can answer? Any thoughts they want to share? Anything that they you'd like to say? Drop it in the comment box. Um, if not, um, I want to give everyone a chance to give their last thoughts. Um, and I, I saw someone else talk about bonds. Um, and I wanted to know if Melba could touch on touch on that. Uh-oh. Okay. 
Um, so the bond industry is like a serious racket. Okay, <laughs> just like, I'm not even gonna mince words. So basically, if you are arrested for a crime, there's depending on the level of crime, there's a, a number that's attached to it. So let's say if it's a misdemeanor, your bond is set at $250 based on whatever the charge is. If it's a felony, it could be $5,000, $10,000. You either A, post the entire amount, which means in the case, let's use the case of a felony, it's $10,000, Boom! You give them ten. You give them the court basically ten grand. If you can't afford that, then you give a percentage. So you give ten percent to a bail bondsman. Bail bondsman takes that money and basically is in charge of making sure you come back to court. If you don't pay back that, you know, you miss an appearance or something like that, it's the bail bondsman. You know, like Dog the Bounty Hunter and all them people are the ones who come knocking down your door looking for you because they're on the hook for the rest of that money. They make a ton of money through this, okay? There's also an insurance company that's behind, there's only like three insurance companies that deal with all of bond and bail bonds, okay? Because they basically insure the bond. So in case you skip town, they're the ones who are also on the hook as well, which is why they pay the dog, the bounty hunters of this world to go look for folks, all right? So a few states are starting to move away from this model of paying for your freedom because the reality is you're paying to be able to be out and fight your case. Because if you don't pay bond, you sit in custody until your case goes to trial. And depending, you know, here in Miami-Dade County, depending on the level of the case, we're looking at two years, three years, four years is not unusual, especially as the case gets more serious. And the criteria that the judge usually uses in setting the bond is whether or not you're likely to come back to court, whether or not you have ties to the community, and whether or not you're a danger to the community, right? So the key should be whether or not you're really a danger to the community. Because if you're somebody who is, let's say it's a domestic violence situation and you have a history of abusing your spouse, well, it's, it's highly likely that you're gonna be a danger to that person. But if you were shoplifting at Macy's, are you really a danger to the public that you need to be held in custody? So some states, for instance, like New York does risk assessments. Um, New Jersey moved away from cash bond altogether. So it's either you're in or you're out, okay? So you're in because based on the risk assessment, you are dangerous, you're a danger to the community or you're out, that's it. And a lot of states are moving towards that model. The downside to that, which I, I wanna caution everybody on, is that the risk assessments themselves can be filled with bias because what are the kinds of things that they're using to determine whether or not you're a risk? How many times you've had contact with the criminal justice system? Well, if you live in certain neighborhoods, you have a lot of contact with the criminal justice system. Doesn't mean you're dangerous. It just means you live in a certain neighborhood. Are they using race? Are they using age? Are they using level of education? So those are the things we have to be careful uh, when we start going down this path of getting rid of cash bonds. I believe firmly we need to get rid of cash bonds and the ACLU of Florida has been working tirelessly across the state as well as our other counterparts across the country to eliminate the cash bail system because it's inherently unfair. You know, being rich does not mean that, you know, you're you're any safer. It just means you're rich. The Menendez brothers were rich, but they killed their parents. You know what I mean? So, you know, these are the kinds of things that, again, we've got to elect lawmakers that are willing to stand up to the powerful bail bonds lobby who's got tons of money and they're going to fight like cats and dogs to be able to, to keep their profit motive going forward. But we're seeing success across the country. Like I said, New Jersey, I want to say New Mexico and other states are working on models to be able to get, get away from cash bond. And one last thing um, in New York, there's the Center for Court Innovation is working on using a model of community courts where you get released 
and you go into a program. So basically, while you're waiting for your case to be on trial, you're out of custody, but you're also getting, you know, drug rehab if that's what you needed, or assistance getting employment if that's what you needed, or if it's anger management you need, you're getting those those skills so that by the time you're able to stand in front of the judge, you can say, judge, in the last six months that I've been out of custody, these are the things I've been able to accomplish. And then that makes it more likely that you're able to get a reduced sentence. People with money, they do that all the time. They don't need a program, right? They just, you know, if it's their kid who has a drug addiction, they pack them off to Delray Beach, they send them to some fancy place for 30 days, and then come back in front of the judge, oh, look, you know, my, my, my family member's clean. Oh, okay, well, let's give the person diversion, as opposed to someone who doesn't have means and doesn't have the ability to be able to use those types of programs to be able to get a better sentence in front of the judge later on. So that's just some of the, the issues that surround bail and, and bail bondsmen. Thank you for sharing, Melba. Thank you. We have one more question. Um, what do folks think about Broward, the backlash that Broward's promised this disciplinary program? Um, and so that's one question. I don't know who wants to answer that question. Um, but I want to say that someone is asking, how can we how can we become engaged advocates on these issues? One way to do that is by volunteering with New Florida Majority. Um, and if you'd like to volunteer with New Florida Majority, we've dropped a link um, in the chat room here. And I'm gonna drop it one more time so that folks can, can um, join. Um, so one way is to join, get involved. We're gonna be working on Amendment 4 this year. We're gonna need volunteers to go out there and engage voters on one, the fact that it's an election year, we're electing a new governor, and two, <clears throat> what are the issues that are important and that impact our communities, and how can we make sure that um, these are some of the things that the folks who are running for office are going to take with them and implement in their platforms and in their policies. Um, so I am going to, and I want to say, if you want to get, if you also want more information on what New Florida Majority does, you can visit our web, website. Um, that's newfm.win you can look at us online you can follow us on twitter new fl majority find us on facebook we're on instagram new fl majority or you can simply text um free fl that's f-r-e-e-f-l to 90975 and we'll be in touch with you we'll let you know about future events that we're having um and future video discussions i'm gonna see if anyone wants to answer this last question um melba is not um says she doesn't know much about the broward promise disciplinary program um does anyone else want to chime in on that um i'm not quite sure See? oh can't hear you i said i'm not familiar i'm not familiar with the piece Do you want to give a plug, anyone? I want to I want to make sure we shout out our friends at the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, led by Desmond Mead, who's been um, he's really spearheaded this entire Amendment Four campaign, um, from gathering petitions to getting it on the ballot. Um, and so you can also look into the Florida Rights Restoration Coalitions. Um, anyone else have anything else? I want to make sure we give Melba time to plug or have any last words. Um, Rod, do you have any last words that you want to share with us? Link. Oops. I'm putting up the link for uh, Florida Rights Restoration website. Okay. Thank you. Can I jump in? Can I jump in real quick? Real quick. Yep. I'm getting echo. I'm getting. Um. So, of course, support the New Florida Majority. Support the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Definitely. Um. Also, if you have time, go look up the Dignity Campaign. 
Mel, but I will be calling you about that because that's something I need help with here in the state of Florida, um, which will be working on women's rights inside of the prison and outside of the prison that they're working on nationwide. And um, if um, just stay tuned, um, myself in partnership with New Florida Majority and other organizations like LEAP, we will be working um, hard to start organizing women, formerly incarcerated women across the state in partnership with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition who actually hosts the um, annual women's retreat for us, which we're so grateful for. Um, so yeah, just pay attention to those things. Um, look out for all of those different things that we'll be working on, the day of empathy that we just had. And we need you to vote, 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 vote. Me, Valencia Gunder needs you to vote so that I can do that and that my brother can and my mom and my dad can, please. Um, and a lot of my other friends can that live here. So please get out there and vote, support, um, make sure that you are loving people because of their policies, not just because of their personalities. And um, just stay active, part of it, stay a part of the conversation, teach the next person what's going on and understand that we are humans too. And we may have made a mistake in the past, but you know, we do not deserve to continue to be criminalized for something we did one time. So thank y'all for having me. Absolutely. Um, I, I just got to say, I lift up everything that's been said today. Uh, v, I got you. So call me. I got you. Whatever you need. And I think the most critical thing is each one teach one. You know, um, I shared 13th with my family and, you know, <laughs> that led to some interesting discussions. But, you know, what for what, what we learn, we have to share with other people. We have to make sure to spread the word. We have to vote yes on Amendment 4 so that we can give our returning citizens the right to vote back. Keep in mind that in Maine and Vermont, you can vote while you're incarcerated. So you guys do the math on that. So, you know, let, let's just let people who have finished their sentence and finished everything they needed to do come back into society because that, you know, we, we call ourselves humans, we call ourselves Christians and, you know, we forgive and we believe in redemption, but it's got to be across the board. It can't just be for some people. So stay engaged, stay woke, make sure to vote. Vote yes on Amendment 4. You can check us out at aclufl.org, and I'll let you know what we're working on. We're always in partnership with New Florida Majority, so I look forward to doing more great things together. And thank you, Renee, and the New Florida Majority, Majority team for giving me the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'd like to say... Uh, on uh, the uh, part about voting, uh, you know, we've had some discussion about our judicial system. People, when Melba talked about you got to vote every election, guess what? You got to vote for your judges. You got to vote for your local state attorney. Whenever you see a black candidate that is trying to run for judge to get elected, don't be cheap. Give them $5, give them $10. It costs money to run. And if you want somebody that looks like you and there's more diversity in the courthouse and when you stand before them, they can relate to you and understand the nuance of your circumstances. This is what it takes. Don't just vote every four years. Don't just vote sometime every two years for the midtime. Vote every single time. I almost cussed, but <laughs> vote every single time. And your local election actually is your most important one. That is the one who decides how much you pay for your water bill and all the other necessities that it takes to run and manage your community. And again, in the judicial system, your judges and your local state attorneys, you know, try to find out and understand as much as you can whenever you see somebody or one of us stepping up to try to run for that office. Uh, again, um, I put the link up for Florida um, Rights Restoration. It's FloridaRRC.com. Get some information there as well as uh, being told about the new Florida majority. And, you know, this midterm election is a real critical one. The ballot's very long. 
you know, unfortunately, it may be intimidating to some people, but I was on a panel discussion the other night uh, with State Representative Bobby DeBose and Florida Senator Thurston. <laughs> And he jokingly said, look, if you get confused, just vote no on everything, but vote yes on four. Just yes on four. Make sure you do that. So in closing, uh, I was um, I felt privileged and I'm honored to be a part of this and to continue the conversation. And I hope that everyone has a uh, great night. And I'm sure that I'll run into you, Valencia, and I hope that I'll meet you, Melba and uh, Renee. I'm wishing you the best because I know you'll be leaving us soon. You're an awesome person, and she's uh, very diligent in what she does. One more plug. This is our last day with Renee. Um, everybody's in the comment section said that you're leaving, but um, we love you so much. And thank you for all of your great work here in the state of Florida. And you're going to make this whole country great. And we appreciate you. I really appreciate all of you. Thank you all for agreeing to be a part of this wonderful conversation. I know that New Florida Majority will, will continue to have these conversations and continue to make um, an impact not only in Miami, in South Florida, but all across the state. I want to thank everyone for joining. Um, thank you so much. I saw someone say that they're not always able to participate, but they're really glad that this was online. And um, that's why we do these things, because we know everyone can't always make it um, to physical meetings and physical discussions. But um, we want to hope that um, a lot more folks will be able to join online. Um, someone else said, will, they, will anyone be putting out a voting guide? Yeah, stay tuned. Someone will. Um, I'm not sure if it will be us, but it will either be us or a partner organization. But if you are registered for this discussion, we'll have your email address <laughs> and we'll be able to stay in touch with you um, around everything election related. Um, there's a couple more things that Melba dropped in. Oh, ACLU will be doing candidate scorecards. Um, so if we have your email address, we'll be able to stay in touch with you guys um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, if no one else has anything to add, I'm going to end the discussion now. Thank you guys for joining. Bye-bye.